aren't going to be here. So yes, hello, hello. Um, I need to share the screen so that we're all looking at that too. There we go. So I updated the starter syntax for R to change the way that R was going to replace the minus 99s that were in the data file with NAs. Mm -hmm. The code that I had written stopped working. <laughs> is the best way that I can describe it. It had to have worked, but then it didn't work. So um, then I showed it to Jonathan and he's like, yeah, that's not gonna work. So he wrote this little function for me instead. So this may be, this is looping over columns explicitly is I think the difference in what, um, what Cass had. So this is, this is a change. So if you had issues getting your missing values replaced in R, then you can steal this code and hopefully it will work for you more consistently. Um, let me get the transcript going, too, because I forgot to do that. There we go. And move it out of the way. Okay. So, yes, while we're on homework, does anyone have homework questions for yeah. me? Yeah, hit me. For the last part, when we must uh, answer some multiple choice questions. Yes. Uh, I have some questions because I think the language is, is weird sometimes. So, for example... <laughs> Probably. <laughs> in, can you see question 48, I think? Question 48. 48 right? Yeah, we consider 46. Can 48. Scroll down? Yep, I will. An absolute. A significant indirect effect? The relationship. That's question? No, uh, 49, for 49. example. 49. A significant direct effect. The relationship between the two. What is the difference between those? Well, I know that you cannot provide the correct answer, but. Uh, to me, for example, one and two are similar, but we can say that if, if the relationship is direct, it's not mediated, but I'm not sure if that's correct or not. What is a direct effect? A direct effect is an arrow going from one box to another box, uh -huh. and that can happen always, regardless of whether there are indirect effects also in the model. But what about the significance? Because if, if the direct relationship is, is significant, what is the meaning of that? Meaning that the, the null hypothesis of zero slope for that, so path and slope are synonyms. Direct effect, path, and slope all mean the same thing. If it's significant, then the null hypothesis of zero relationship is rejected, so there is some kind of relationship detectable okay. by your sample size. But we can also have indirect effect between variables. Yes, an indirect effect is the multiplication of two direct effects. Yeah. We're going to talk about that today. Okay. Um. Does ah, that and help? Question, yes, and A question 47, I think. Okay, question that, 47. That was uh, weird too. 47, absolute. The model, let me read. Yeah, we haven't um, we haven't done the example that that would go with this yet. Okay. That's today. It was a uh, question about the um, a, a exogenous no in exogenous? endogenous predictors. Yeah, that's one of the first questions I think. Um, yeah, in that 43? case, for example, just in an univariate model, a multivariate normal, endogenous. No, it's not the one. Sorry, I cannot remember what is, but I think that the question is, is weird because it, it talks about what happened when we introduce some exogenous variable into the likelihood. Mm -hmm. What happened with all the exogenous predictors? I remember that question. I got to find number. it. Yeah, that this one. one yes. The very last one. The last one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because in that, in that case, number one, it says all exogenous variables. But we are not intro. We are not considering all exogenous variables. Ah, um, just just exogenous variables who are being included in the likelihood. That's that's my question, and I think that's weird because. Okay. Yeah. That that is that is a my bad. Um, so I meant for like if these are the exogenous variables, then it's ah, referring to the same. Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I did not mean for that to be as ambiguous as it great. came out. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. And there's no. Okay, who else wants to play? No more questions. None yet? 
that's fair. It's not due for another week and a day. So if you've got other things more pressing, then by all means. Uh, would you like to see how your evaluations are coming along? I sent out reminders yesterday. Survey says 19 out of 23. Getting there. So two more people. So 83% 80, response rate is not bad, but it's nowhere near what I'm used to. My, my personal best was fall 2020. I hit 100% in both classes. And if you'd like to know why I started doing this, here's my first semester. Two people out of five. <laughs> That's not good. <laughs> so I had decided I had to take action. So since then, it's gotten better. But. All right. uh, doo -doo -doo. Let's see. Schedule updates. There are not any. Uh, just to remind you, next week, no classes, but I am having office hours during the time I would normally be teaching. So you can stop by. Those are on Zoom only, of course. And one thing that I have not done yet that I intend to do is to update the printable version of the syllabus so that it matches what actually happened <laughs> as on this page as opposed to what I thought might happen. That way you can have a finished version to send to whomever if you need to show like what this class covered or whatever if anyone has any questions about it. So it's good to keep your syllabi for all your classes because you never know when they will come in handy for various documentation efforts. But I will fix that and let you know when it's available. All right. So any other homework questions, logistics questions, schedule questions, any of that stuff? No? OK, cool. All right, then I will shut that off. Then we have um, some remainder stuff to pick up today, most notably a little bit of examples with mediation. So I'm not going to go through all the slides, but I do have to go through about three or four of them so that we can have a context for the example. So where I am starting then is lecture six, slide 40. And mediation is something that I personally think is stupid. I'm just going to put it out there. I, I'm not, I'm not, I've not and drank the Kool-Aid. And I apologize to Chris Preacher and all these other people who've made their career advancing methods for mediation because I just don't care. I think it's stupid. The reason that I think it's stupid is that it's a better marketing campaign to describe the idea of unique effects, in my opinion. So the idea of mediation is that we want to know whether or not the relationship between X and Y differs after we control for a so-called mediator M. That's what mediation means. So to me, that is not interestingly different than what a unique effect would regularly be in any linear model. But it is a thing. So mediation is a very common type of research question. Um, it is something that even in the IES grant guidelines, they want you to examine mediation and moderation. So I want you to be familiar with the language as well as the techniques for testing it because it turns out it's just one more step relative to what you would regularly have to do to fit any kind of path model. As a point of clarification, though, just to make sure that you understand the distinction, mediation and moderation are not synonyms. They are different. So this path model at the top here is your classic mediation triangle, where x is thought to be some kind of explanatory variable. It then causes m. m causes y is the logic behind this. So an example would be something like, I have an intervention that is designed to improve parents whatever. And if parents whatever improves, then hopefully that will trickle down to improve kid whatever. So the mechanism by which the intervention would affect child outcomes is because the intervention affects parents who affect children. That would be the type of idea. So theoretically, there should be a causal type of relationship that's at least plausible for these variables. In contrast, a moderation variable moder model excuse me, is just an interaction term. It's the idea that the relationship between x and y differs as a function of m. Not is caused by, but differs. And when I make uh, analysis plans and grant applications, or if I'm making a presentation, I might draw a figure that looks like this as a conceptual representation, but it is actually not a very useful way to think about it from an estimation point of view because you can't have an arrow predict another arrow. So the model that is on the bottom is more accurately conveying what is actually happening, where we have two predictors, X and M, as well as their interaction term, and each of those would have a direct effect in the model. And whether or not there's covariances in here, 
depends on whether or not these variables were brought into the likelihood as exogenous or whether they stay fully exogenous. So where I see people get this type of language confused is things like person characteristics, like age as a mediator or gender as a mediator. Do you think that that is logically possible for, those vari for variables like that to be mediators? Can age be a mediator? Because I've seen people phrase this, these sorts of questions before. My view would be no, because in order for age to be a mediator, you'd have to have some predictor that causes you to age. And the only thing that causes you to age is the calendar and also having children. Am I right? <laughs> so other than that, personal characteristics are things that are already there. There's nothing that's going to cause them or change them those would be moderators instead of mediators. So we're talking about mediation as a new flavor of linear model activity. So the big question then is usually phrased with these letters involved, and this is sort of a, a universally accepted set of notation. We have the A path, as it's known, which is the original predictor X to the mediator. The B path is from the mediator to the outcome. And then we have this path C that goes between X and Y. And in a model that is not controlling for the mediator, C would represent the bivariate relationship between X and Y. After the mediator is introduced and given a direct effect in predicting Y, so this B path here right, is a slope, then the question is, is this C path different after controlling for M than it was before? If so, then we would say that we would have at least med mediation to some extent. And it works out mathematically, at least with observed variables in the exact case, that the answer to the question is C before different than C prime after. That answer is the same answer as whether or not the slopes that go from X to M multiplied by the slope that goes from M to Y create a significant effect. And so the multiplication of these two slopes is itself a new term that we're going to estimate, get a standard error for, and get a hypothesis test for. And that multiplication is called an indirect effect. So direct effects are from one box to another. Indirect effects concern at least two arrows with a box in the middle. Okay, with me so far? So the once upon a time way that people started doing this with, was with a series of regressions. So there is a classic article that's been cited like 8 million times about how to do this. And they lay out the regression models that you would have to estimate. You'd have to do X and Y by itself, then X predicting M, and then M predicting Y, and then X and M both predicting Y, and that would give you all of the information that you would need potentially to compute this indirect effect. Nowadays, path model software makes it easy to do all of this simultaneously rather than a set of regressions, and that, that offers other significant advantages as well. So it used to be the case that people thought that you had to have a significant relationship between X and Y for this to even be a possible activity for you. That is not the case anymore. Because technically speaking, in order for there to be a significant indirect effect, all that means is that the path of C is different before than after. So different could be a lot of things. It could be significant and now it's not. It could be non-significant and now it is. It could be positive, but now it's negative. It could be just different is the key idea. So you can still test mediation even if you don't initially have this relationship here before controlling for the mediator. However, uh, the old rules with respect to A and B still apply. It doesn't make sense to test mediation if there is no relationship between X and M in the first place. Because there's no possible way then that the relationship between X and Y could be due to M if these parts don't matter. So that, that part is sort of a gatekeeper for doing this type of activity. Uh, people argue about how the best way is to estimate a standard error for that indirect effect. And it involves 
not just the standard errors of the direct effects, but also some covariances and stuff like that. So the, the method that we will see in software directly is what's known as the Sobel test. And that is just pretending like it's any other linear combination and treating the sampling distribution of the indirect effect as if it's normal. So we can do this in a variety of ways. I'll show you in a couple different programs how to do this. Um, there's a lot of people, though, who study this that say, no, 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 you shouldn't do it this way. You need to do something fancier. It needs to involve bootstrapping or perhaps bays or something else. And to be honest, I haven't kept up in that literature because every time that I've had to do this for real, doing it the rightest way with respect to the Sobel test changes the p-value in like the third decimal place. I just haven't seen it matter. But I have some resources in here that talk about um, why this is as well as what you can do instead with respect to that, as well as bootstrapping of the estimates if you don't have the original data. So I'll show you how to do it with the Sobel test. This additional stuff you can figure out on your own if you need to have it. Okay. So do you want to see a mediation model? Mm -hmm. Why not, right? I've got example 6A. True story, by the way. So this is from a published paper in 2013 with a former colleague and friend of mine from the University of Nebraska, Sarah Gervais is her name. And where this project came from is Reviewer 2. So back when I uh, used to have office hours to do statistical consulting and such at the Department of Psychology in Nebraska, where I also taught graduate coursework, uh, she came to see me. And this is the model that we ended up with. But where her initial submission was, was like 30 separate regression models to get all of these effects, as well as how each of these effects potentially differs by gender. So her question was whether or not the relationships among these variables differed between college men and college women. And the reviewers were like, can you please just do a simultaneous path model? I can't keep track of 30 regressions. And she said, do, do you know how to do that? I'm like, yes, I know how to do that. So I showed her how to do that, and she picked it up real quick. She's like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe I didn't know how to do this. It's so, it's so much easier to do all the regressions at once. So this is part of the reason why, in your homework, I don't have the typical drop-down menus of interpretation for the path model because it's not different than usual. All of the things that you learned about how to interpret a slope and whether it's positive or negative and whether it's significant or not, all of that is the same. The complexity is just having all of these relationships at the same time and making sure that your model hasn't overlooked any relationships. So the setup here, typo, Oxford comma for life, the setup here then is that she's interested in the extent to which mindfulness as a predictor variable predicts something called warmth towards feminists. And she had these four potential mediators and when she was explaining all of these variables to me, I could not keep track of them because they all sounded like the same thing to my non-social psychology brain. So I had to label them. So in the published article, the, I, my labels are still on the picture. This is X, this is M1, this is M2, M3, M4, and Y. What's not in the picture are covariances between all four of the mediators. So in this context, because I have all possible direct paths from X to M to Y, as well as covariances for all the relationships among the Ms, this model is going to be just identified. So I haven't left anything out, which means I don't have to worry about misfit being a problem. It's going to fit perfectly because I've spent all the degrees of freedom. So I have two models in this example, one with the full sample, which we'll do first, and the second model is using what's called multiple group modeling to estimate the path models separately but simultaneously for men and for women. So I'll show you how to do that. That is what's known as moderated mediation, by the way, in the literature. Not to be confused with mediated moderation, which is a separate thing. So here is the path model from the published article. Here is a correlation matrix among key variables where the correlations for men are above the diagonal and the correlations for women are below the diagonal. Um, and so I have words here describing what I'm doing. I have a new uh, record in this handout. There's four different packages. But in the interest of time, I'm going to focus uh, not so much on SAS and on the others. But this is Procalus, 
which is how SAS does path models as well as structural equation models. It's older and it doesn't have as many options. So I, I tend not to do this in practice, but I wanted to figure out how to do it just to see what was possible. So this is the single group model setup if you wanted to use SAS. Here is what it looks like in Stata. So a lot of this is the same as what we saw in the family data example, where we have each of the six, um, what do we call it, no, five variables being estimated, their intercepts being estimated rather. I have x to y, then I have x to each of the m's, then I have all the m's to y right here, so my labels out here describe which part of the path model I'm tackling. I have the variances of everything as well as the covariances, and I found this command that shortens the code a little bit. Cove struck with the option unstructured estimates all possible residual covariances between the four mediators. And I am using full information maximum likelihood, but I'm throwing in robust standard errors. Because these are all scale scores that I'm looking at. Several of them are going to be skewed to some extent. People don't want to admit if they are sexist. So there's a lot of people who are going to be near the floor on those measures, for instance. Uh, it is supposed to compute total effects for you, but I found that it actually didn't do it correctly or else I'm not reading the output correctly. So I made all of the indirect effects myself. So this right here is the first new part. And where these labels came from is what Stata labeled the paths. So in the other programs, you get to label them yourself. In Stata, you do not. But note that what we have is one path here which is going from X to M1, literally multiplying the second path, which is from M1 to Y. So I am asking it to do math on my slopes, but rather than add them together in some kind of linear combination like we would normally do, they're multi being multiplied. So I have four potential indirect effects here, because in my picture I have four mediators. So each of these is an A path, essentially. Each of those is a B path, and I can see to what extent um, the relationship between mindfulness as X and warmth as Y is changed after accounting for those mediators. I also computed um, total effects. So this is a thing that in some disciplines is a big deal and in others is not so much. But what I am doing is adding together all of the indirect effects as well as the direct effect from uh, X to Y. And then I have a separate one that's adding together all of the total indirect effects. So then that will show up in other parts of the output, but I'm doing the math here because this method is more general. Only sometimes will the program do it for you. So I wanted to show you how to do it. Okay, so Stata users, have a look at this. Any questions? Not yet? Good, okay, cool. Okay, our users. So I have in R brought the X variable into the likelihood. So in M plus and in R, you have a choice as to whether you do this. And it changes what that variable then is allowed. So mindfulness as the X, so the box over here, does not have to be part of the likelihood. The likelihood can be conditional on X if I want it to be. However, because I had some missing data, I decided to bring it into the likelihood so that I could have missing data on it. So it was an exogenous predictor. By bringing it into the likelihood, that changes two things about it. I'm allowed to have missing data on it under an assumption of missing at random, but I have to assume that it's normally distributed. And in this case, because nothing's predicting it, I have to assume that it is marginally normally distributed, not conditionally. Cough, cough, homework questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, st I stopped doing it properly because it hurt my throat. But if I were going to do it properly, it would be <coughs> homework question. That's how you do it. That's the homework question. Just to be clear, so 
when we include an exogenous predictor into the likelihood, we are assuming that it's multivariate normal, mm -hmm. but if we do not include a predictor for that exogenous predictor, so it's a marginal. That's right. Because okay. it's, it's still a predictor in terms of its role in the model, yeah, but, but technically it's an outcome with respect exactly. to the estimation. So that's where exogenous, endogenous predictor and outcome get like screwy with the language. The way that I approach it is, is this variable in the likelihood, yes or no? If it's in the likelihood, you can have missing data and you have distributional assumptions on it. But then relative to the context of the model, if it's still a predictor, then it's a marginal assumption because there's nothing left over. There's no, there's, there's nothing predicting it to turn it into a residual. So mindfulness in this example is the only variable that's like that. It's an X, but I brought it into the likelihood. That means I have missing data is okay under missing at random and distributional assumptions then apply. So the others are all going to be estimated for me, but I'm writing them out with labels so that you can see what it would look like if you wanted to constrain them or do something else with them. So the star one, these are all intercepts. The variable squiggle squiggle with itself, these are either going to be variances or residual variances. Variances if it's a predictor that's not an outcome of anything, and residual variances if it is indeed an outcome. Then we have the x to y path here. So I have labeled these with the roles that they play. So for somebody like me who's not as familiar with the content of this study, all these words sort of sound the same to me, and there's no way I'm going to keep them straight. So I built this system of labels that will help me look at the output and understand it more readily. So x to y is what this path is called. x to m1, x to m2, m3, and m4. So this is the left side of the, path, of the model, of the, the, uh, the x variable going into the mediators. Then the right side of the model, warmth, is the y variable. And then here are all four of the mediators. So I have labeled each of those as well. I have estimated residual covariances. So there are six possible residual covariances among the four mediators. And then I built my indirect effects. So this colon equal sign is how you tell it, make a new thing out of the parameters that I've already estimated. So it's not a separate variable, it's just doing math for you of various kinds. So then x to m1 times m1 to y creates the a times b multiplicative indirect effect that I have labeled x to m1 to y. <laughs> time. So there are four possible indirect effects all made here. I have the total effect which adds the four indirect plus the direct from x, and then I have the total indirect, because these are sometimes things people care about, and they're easy to get because you can just literally add them together. Then we feed that entire set of syntax, which I've called syntax single, because it's a single group model, into the Levon call. I'm using MLR, so I'm getting robust maximum likelihood that's going to adjust any fit statistics as well as parameter standard errors for deviations from multivariate non-normality. So I would probably just do that by default in, in like an analysis in real life in the SEM class, everything's MLR to start with. The reason that in your homework six I did not is because Stata doesn't have this. So to make it so that people could use different packages, I asked you in your homework to use regular ML. But I don't think I asked any questions. That should change as a function of that. I was just trying to keep everything uh, equally, uh, keep the results as similar as possible. So are folks, any questions on my syntax here? What's happening? How can we get R squares with this syntax? You will get R squares if you ask for R square equals uh, true. Okay. So it's an extra piece of output that you have to request within the summary. Uh, likewise, standardized effects would give you standardized slopes and residual correlations, cough, cough, homework question as well. Um, in M+, plus, the R squares are part of the standardized output, so it's all one thing. And I've asked for fit measures in the interest of completeness, but in this context, I don't need them. As you can see down here, 
Here is my test statistic and my degrees of freedom for the model. So this is the Levon R output. Now, I'm seeing zeros here, right? Is that what I should see or did I screw something up? My test statistic is exactly zero and my degrees of freedom are zero. Just it's just identified. So yes, this is what I should see. I have either a two-headed covariance or a directed arrow slope between everything, every pair. So it's going to perfectly recreate the original covariance matrix of these six variables. Because each variable has either a mean or an intercept, each variable also has either a variance or a residual variance, and I've got all possible pairwise combinations of relationships represented with either slopes or covariances. Not to be confused with the next piece of output, which M plus provides as well and I find usually useless, M model test for the baseline model. What this is telling me is the difference um, in fit, a likelihood ratio test chi-square is what these numbers mean, between the best possible H1 saturated model and the worst possible independence model that says all the covariances are zero. So the fact that this is significant is basically telling me I've got something worth modeling. I've got some kind of covariance going on here. So then the rest of my fit indices are perfect. So comparative fit and non-standard or unstandardized comparative fit, the TLI, whatever the hell that's called, NNFI, sometimes in other programs, that's all one. RMSEA is zero. Root mean square residual is zero. So all of these things are perfect. And here are the uh, AIC and BIC if you wanted to do any other kinds of benchmarks against this model. So the HO and H1 fit are the same because the model is saturated. It's just identified. All right. Any questions on the fit stuff? So if we did have degrees of freedom left over and if fit was a problem, then we would not continue. We would fix it first because all of the relationships are predicated on the idea that the, that the model fits. Otherwise, they have to stretch and shrink to try and adjust for the misfit, and, it, and that would bias what the coefficient should be. It's kind of like a, a formation. So anybody here in the marching band in high school or d dance team, as I was? Like, all of that stuff is, all, you have to walk in formation, right? You make, like, everybody has to be in a certain place for the visual to look correct. And if somebody's sick that day and doesn't come and they leave a hole, it looks really bad. So to fill in the hole you're, in your formation, you, everyone would have to move over a little bit and like to make it so that it doesn't look like there's a giant hole. That's what happens in these analyses. If there's a hole, then all of the other parameters have to rearrange themselves a little bit to try and plug in the hole. So um, that's why fit is the precursor to looking at your results. But we have fit here. So here's what we ended up with then. So we have the unstandardized estimate in the first column, standard error in the second column. Estimate divided by standard error gives me my test statistic, which is treated as a Z because we do not use denominator degrees of freedom in these software packages, although one could in theory. My p-value, and then two types of standardized results. You want the last one, standardize all. So that is as if all of the variables in the analysis had been z-scored into mean zero, standard deviation one. So then the slopes are standardized slopes and the covariances are turned into correlations. So I have a few significant relationships here. Um, there is no direct path. The C path is non-significant after controlling for the four mediators. It looks like my path from X to some of the mediators, so X1 is significant, X3 is significant. So those two then would potentially be eligible to have significant indirect effects. The other two would not because the X2, M2, or the X to M paths are not significant. I'm doing all four indirect effects anyway, though, just to, for the sake of illustration, because we did that in the paper as well. Then we have all the six covariances among the mediators. And then 
uh, R does not care about the distinction between predictor and outcome. It says everything is an intercept, even though technically this is a mean, not an intercept, because it's unconditional. So you can think of this as what the fixed intercept would be in an empty model if this were an outcome variable. Likewise, under variances, it doesn't tell you which kind is which. Maybe that's what the dot means. I wonder if that means something, because that one doesn't have a dot. So it's being treated differently. Or I could have just copied it wrong. I'm not sure. <laughs> but uh, we've got the, the, the variances of each of the variables here, and then the R square. So here is a, another cough, cough homework question. It forgot one. It didn't list an R square for the mind X variable. Why do you think that is? The mindfulness X variable is not in my list here. You say it's zero? It is zero, because it's not being predicted by anything. So it's R square has to be zero. And then here are the new parameters. So x to, x to m1 to y is the multiplication of two paths. So we have an estimate, a standard error, and treating it as if its sampling distribution were normal, just like any other slope, it would be considered significant. This is the part that reviewer three is going to be like, you can't use a Sobel test. You got to bootstrap that or something. OK, it'll still be significant after we bootstrap it, though. I can, I can tell you that much. Likewise, we also have a significant indirect effect through the third mediator. So those were the two that were eligible for that to happen, this one and that one. And then we can see the other parts of it, that one and that one. So part of the relationship between mindfulness and warmth towards feminists is because of internal motivation to avoid sexism as well as hostile sexism, whatever the hell that means. Any social psychologists here? No? Am I the closest thing? Because that's scary. Anywho, you can read the paper. I put it in the download packet for this example. If you want to know about the story there. Okay, so any questions on the R output, indirect effects and otherwise? Yes? In this context, the R square for each of the outcomes, mm -hmm. the meaning of, of that is, for example, that uh, dot zero thirteen. That's the variance explained by the predictor mindfulness for for that outcome. Correct. But in the case of warm, mm -hmm. that's that's not the sum of the previous values, but the meaning is uh, the variance explained by the uh, mediators. The mediators and the x. So there's five uh, different variables that are predicting warmth. Okay. So that the, it, so 25% of its variance was predicted by those five variables. Great. Whereas the only thing predicting each of these is one predictor. Okay. And it did a crappy job. So 1% explained variance significant enough because we have a large enough sample size. Okay. Other questions? All right. M plus then. So one catch with respect to the data. I would highly recommend that you store your M plus data file in the same folder as the input. Otherwise, you have to type out the full path to where this is. And in particular, with the virtual desktop, this gets tricky because the path can get very, very long across all of the folder directories. So in SEM, I had folks move their M plus files to their H drive so that the path would be short enough to where it didn't cause problems for the system. But that is something that I've found that's unique to the Iowa virtual desktop. I haven't seen this at any other university I've worked at. So we have names and used variables, and I started these in your starter syntax, but just as a teachable moment here, I see people do this a lot when they first start using M plus is forget this line because it's not technically required. It will run without it. So what do you think would happen if I forgot the use variables line? The, the analysis will consider from all the variables. It will throw everything in the model including ID. So it will treat it as, an, as a variable whose mean and variance and covariance gets estimated. And I'm pretty sure that person ID is not going to co-vary with anything. At least it shouldn't, right? 
but that will screw everything up. <laughs> so make sure that you have your use variables and make sure that you're defining any missing data codes that you've used. So I am using robust maximum likelihood. If you use that, you cannot also request bootstrapping. It's either or. So, but I included the syntax as to how you would request bootstrap samples in M+. I think you can do this in R as well, from what Jonathan told me. So I can change this to be regular ML if I wanted and turn on the bootstrap option, and then I would get bootstrap standard errors for everything, not just for the indirect effects. And I can also add confidence intervals with respect to that too. So in M plus then, just like in R, I am bringing that X predictor into the likelihood so that I can have missing data on it, but then have distributional assumptions by estimating its mean and its variance. So things in brackets, again, these are either means or intercepts. When you list the variable all by itself, you're, diff you're referring to its variance. The terms in parentheses are labels for each of these parameters. Likewise, here's all my intercepts for the other variables, here's all of my residual variances for the other variables, and here's the labels that go with them. Note that every single line ends in a semicolon. So that's one way to screw up your code is to forget the semicolons. The, the comments don't have to, but I often do because I get so used to doing it in SAS. And note that the exclamation point is the comment indicator in M+. So then we have the left side of the model, or the middle, I should say, this is x to y. Here's the left side where I've stacked up all the mediators. So these are all y's on x is the way to think about that. Um, I often used to get confused until I thought if I just switch the on to an equal sign in my head, then I can keep the order straight. Because whenever we write an equation, it's outcome equals linear model. It's the same here. So think of an on as an equal sign. And these are not case sensitive, by the way but I am in the habit of writing program-specific commands in capital letters and variable names in some combination of title case, usually. Then we get the right side of the model, and then the widths. So this width is going to allow all possible residual covariances to be estimated because I listed the same four mediators on each side of it. If in your homework you're running into trouble with your widths being understood correctly, I would break it into multiple lines. I've seen it have trouble parsing correctly when the width command spans multiple lines. So, and then one thing I forgot to mention before, do I have it? Not in this handout. I have it at the top of the input file. M plus only reads to 90 characters. So if you have syntax that goes past 90 characters, it doesn't read it, and that can mess up your model. So you will generate an error message to warn you that that has happened. But at the top of my input files, I often put like 90 exclamation points across so that I can see like how wide it is and make sure that I don't I stay within those barriers. Then we get the indirect effects. So the way this works is that you first have to use the new command to label the new terms that you're creating out of existing model parameters. They have to have names. So I'm naming them, and the names can only have eight characters, of course, so you have to be a little bit creative. So I've got my four indirect effects plus my total effects plus my total indirects, and then down here I'm defining how they get created. So literally multiplying the path labels together to get the four indirect effects, and then summing them with the total to get the total and total indirect. So all of this is, in this case, done for you if you do this instead. They have a command called model indirect that figures out all the possible indirect effects, total effects, and all the stuff. So I have that down here for demonstration purposes, along with the caveat, the only situation in which you can take advantage of this feature is if you are willing to say that everything is multivariate normal. So if you're fitting a generalized model with link functions or any of that, you can't do this. If you're fitting a multi-level model that has random effects or latent variables, you can't do that. So I wanted to show you how to do it the long way because that is a more general approach that will work in more circumstances. Model indirect only works sometimes. Okay, questions on M plus code? Yes. Can you explain again the meaning of total effect 
indirect and direct? Uh, the total effects is the sum of all of the predictive paths that that terminate in that variable. So it's the sum of the to of the indirect effects and any direct effects. And in this case, there's only one direct effect. Some people care about that. Mm -hmm. That's what I will say. Some people care. Um, like apparently in sociology, uh, Kelly told me that that's a big thing in sociology. People want to know what the total effects are. So that's how you make them. But I don't find it terribly helpful. Yeah. <laughs> so that's that's the meaning. That, it's, it's, it's just it, a it's a total. A, yeah, a total I mean, effect. and they're all on different scales too. Like that. That's why I don't find it useful because there's no restraint that all of these slopes are interpreted similarly, but they're still mm -hmm. going to add them together. Um, to me, like the idea of a total, like how well does this model predict this variable? That's our square. Mm -hmm. I find that much more useful. So this is how one would do it. I. It doesn't make any sense to me as a, as a useful piece of information. Okay, other questions? All right, so then here's my fit. So HO, this is my log likelihood for my model. Remember, you are the hoe. H1 is the saturated model, and because this is just identified, I spent all the parameters they match. This is the scaling correction that tells you how far off from multivariate normality you are, where one means perfect. So this is not too bad. Um, then here are the unstandardized estimates. So Levon puts this into a more succinct table. M plus takes longer. So this is model results in the original scales of the variables, estimate, standard error, test statistic, p-value. And then there's a separate version of this entire table that's the standardized solution. So you just have to keep scrolling to get to that. Um, one other thing that I noticed that's different between R and M plus is this demarcation of means versus intercepts. So for mindfulness, this is the x variable that isn't being predicted. So what is being estimated for it is an unconditional mean, whereas for the variables that are being predicted, what's being in the estimated is their intercept, their expected outcome when all the predictors are zero. Likewise, variance versus residual variance. Variance means unconditional, marginal, whereas residual variance means conditional, leftover. And then last but not least, here are my indirect effects and my total effects and total indirect. And here's the output for model indirect that tells me the exact same thing in this case. All right. How are we doing? Yeah, not so bad, right? Not so bad. So here is then, to answer her actual question, she wanted to know how the indirect effects differed between college men and college women. So these are like sophomore psychology students in this sample. That's why I'm saying it that way. So I'm going to fit then, to answer that question, a multiple group version of the model. And the key idea here is that we have split the data into two groups. We are estimating the same path model for both groups simultaneously but separately. And then we can ask for comparisons of all of the model parameters to see which ones are significantly different using well tests. So I have the code in Procalus to do this. Here is the code in Stata. And Stata has a really nice feature denoting the multiple groups here. So the group option, it and I'm telling it how the data are organized into groups. And you can tell it which parameters you want to be invariant. So this is language that you will learn about in SEM if you take that class. Um, but invariant means the same. Non-invariant means different. And you would think that they would just say variant for different, but no, it's non-invariant. English is such a mess. It gets even worse when you layer on like statistical language on it. So yeah, what this is saying is that I want full non-invariance, which means everything gets to be different. <laughs> Not to be confused, by the way, with diff, which is differential item functioning, which is non-invariance. So I asked for then the indirect effects separately by gender 
and it took uh, some detective work to figure out how to do that, but I've, I managed to do so. So it's labeling the paths with which group it's for. Zero is the baseline and one is the alternative. And so I have all of the possible indirect effects for each group. And then this really cool thing right here. This is saving me so much code that I had to type in the other packages. It's going to automatically test the differences across the groups in each parameter for me. So it does it all. In R, then, the way that we can set it up to do multiple groups is to provide each parameter with two different labels. So this, is, by the way, is a, a piece of coding advice for you. If you're very careful in your coding, then find and replace can be your best friend. So all of these, uh, like Notepad, WordPad, Word, all of the text editors for these things have a, an option for control of uh, find and replace. And you can do find and replace selectively by variable case. So for instance, if I label all of the M paths here for men with the lowercase m, and I want to then highlight some text and change it to be for the women, so long as I'm doing lowercase m everywhere, I can swap that out for lowercase w. And it wouldn't overwrite the capital M's because it's case sensitive. So you can develop your own system of writing this so that you can easily find and replace to, to create new chunks of code without doing very much typing. So I have lowercase m as the parameter for the male group, who is going to be the reference, and then lowercase w as the parameter for the women group as the alternative. So every single parameter then has two labels attached to it at this point. So I'm estimating everything separately but simultaneously. That means then I have two different sets of indirect effects, and I am also asking for differences in all of the direct effects across groups. So I'm adding additional new terms that are linear combinations that create differences in the direct effects. So the M version minus the W version, for instance. So this is the same type of thing that you've been doing all semester using estimate statements, GLHTs, Lincoms, and all of that. So these will give us a Z test statistic for how different those two parameters are. And I did the same thing for the indirect effects and the same thing for the total effects as well. In the Levon call, you would tell it what your grouping variable is. And so then that will help uh, it parse the model output into what it should be for each group. All right, questions on that? Okay. So then here's my just identified model. Da, 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 da. So then I, it labels it separately for each group. So here is the zero group model for the men. I put that in. So all of these parameters are for the men in the sample. And then we get all of the same parameters again for the women. And the new parameters that I wrote then at the end, these are all the differences. So first we have the indirect effects for each group. So it looks like, for instance, the men have a significant indirect effect through mediator number one, whereas the women do not. So right underneath it. And that's my paper. <laughs> that's our finding. That's the manuscript. So we have the indirect effects for each group, the total effects for each group, these, the ones that start with D, are differences in direct effects. So the fact that, for instance, this direct effect is significant means that it is significantly more positive for, let's see, I did men versus women, so it's going to be uh, more positive for women, I think. And I can go back up here and find it, so let's look at that real quick. So yeah, for men, it is this one. This one right here, it's 0.63, and then for women, it is doo -doo 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 -doo. that one. Yeah, so much more positive for men. And so then I have the differences in the indirect effects at the same time. So then you can look at all of the possible, uh, possible differences. So this is analogous. These multiple group models are analogous to fitting a moderation model where gender is your moderator. It's as if you put in interactions with gender for every single parameter. 
And these are the simple effects of what it would be for men and what it would be for women and their differences. The only catch is that in this framework, you can test for group differences in variances, in covariances, not just at your fixed effects. So it's more flexible on the whole. And then here's the stuff for M+. Plus. We have the grouping thing right here that tells it who's who. And then I have model, which is going to be for the, the reference group. And then I have model for the alternative group. So we write out two different statements in M+. Plus, and this is where the lowercase uh, m cop find and replace feature was most helpful. So I can copy all that, paste it down here, and change the m's to w's, and it works perfectly. And then here's all of the indirect effects, differences in direct, differences in indirect, etc. So a whole lot of typing, but not a lot of complexity. These are just slopes and differences in slopes. So questions on any of that? So then we get the same output, albeit labeled differently. And last but not least, Another way of doing the same difference testing across groups would be to re-estimate the model holding a particular parameter to be the same across groups and then looking at the change in fit. So for instance, if I wanted a hypothesis test as to whether the X to M1 path differed across groups, then I would use the same label in both places. So I did that, for instance, in Stata right here for the, the group model for zero and the group model for one. And I did that by putting just one label in the parentheses in R and using the same label in the parentheses in both models. And then we do get a test of model fit for one degree of freedom. That is the test of whether that path wants to be different across groups. And yes, it does, significantly so. So it's the same conclusion that we got from doing it as a wall test instead. And that's it. Not so bad, huh? Not so bad. So I know that that was a little bit quick, but uh, all of this type of stuff, if you take the SEM class, you'll get to see again and have circles in the model too, latent variables. We have a whole unit. I know, it's exciting, isn't it? Circles. We have a whole unit on invariance testing and diff testing and all that kind of fun stuff. So, um, All right. Good with this? Good enough anyway? Good enough. Okay. Then I got one more thing to show you which is what it looks like if you fit a path model with generalized linear models in it. So this is example 6b, one model. So this is a paper that I published um, as a follow-up study to my dissertation, which was looking at the extent to which simulator driving performance could be predicted from various measures of vision and attention. And in that original study, we had a driving simulator at the hospital that older adults came and they did, um, they, they basically had a bunch of different outcomes as to well, how well they drove. And five years later, we had a research assistant call everyone up and say, hey, you know that study that you did at the hospital five years ago? Have you crashed your car since then, by chance? And lo and behold, some people had. So we went through and looked at... Um, that outcome as to whether or not they've been in an accident that was at least partially their fault. And it turned out that their performance in the simulator five years earlier significantly predicted who was likely to get into an accident five years later. That one correlation I turned into a paper. It's a brief report. So most journals have something like that as a format called brief report. And I got to tell you, it looks like a real paper, doesn't it? but it's really tiny. It's only four pages long. And I think the manuscript itself was maybe like 12 pages or something, and it went through review really quickly. So I'm a big fan of the brief report. If you have just a little, little finding you want to put out there, boom. So one correlation. Now, I can't just write a paper about one correlation. i got to throw everything else in. So this is my path model. And I'm, I'm really quite proud of this. Isn't this beautiful? This is, this is a PowerPoint drawing. So I found a way to get all of the paths going either to, these are my predictors, this is simulator impairment as the outcome of the original study. I also gave them a questionnaire about whether they had um, limited their driving in the past five years. And then these are two outcomes, 
whether or not they were in an at least partially at fault accident and whether or not they had gotten a speeding ticket. So these are both binary outcomes. That means that I need to have some kind of link function to keep their predicted probabilities and bounds, right? What am I going to pick? Logit. Logit. Too logit to quit. So all of these slopes from the predictors into accidents and the predictors into speeding tickets, these are in logits. That means I would want odds ratios as my effect sizes. In contrast, all of the slopes going into simulator impairment, which was a continuously distributed variable and reported limit in driving, these are going to be just regular identity links. So you can mix and match. You can have variables of different kinds and different types of models. So then the only catch, and I screwed this up, by the way. This is why this is in blue. In the original article, this wasn't here. Do you know why it wasn't here? Because I didn't know how to do it then. <laughs> Fair, right? But what I tried to do is put a residual covariance between these two boxes because this was the only path in the model that was not already accounted for by a direct path. I didn't want one to predict the other. I wanted them just to covary. And M plus is like, nope, can't do it. They're binary, sorry. And I just accepted that and left it out. So I wrote back to the reviewers, yeah, my model's just identified. I couldn't fit the covariance and they published it. That's wrong. What I can do, and I'll show you how to do, is cheat essentially by putting in a random intercept. So this is a circle. It's a latent factor. It means that it is being measured by these two variables. That's what the arrows into it mean. And I fixed these two paths to be one and estimated its variance. And what that does is then create a covariance between these two outcomes. So this is the indirect way of putting in dependency when you have a generalized linear model. It's analogous to what happens in bifactor models in IRT world. So that's the new piece. And I'm only doing this model in M plus, I think, if I remember correctly. Yep. No, I did do it in SATA. SATA was the other one I could do it in. Because I wanted to use full information maximum likelihood, because missing data was not going to be at random. So not everybody in the study answered the phone with respect to their follow-up uh, information. Some of them had actually died. So do you think that people who are missing these outcomes are going to be missing these outcomes completely at random? Or do you think there might be a reason that some people ended up dying or crashing their car? Probably reasons. So the idea of using limited information on a summary of the data and assuming completely at random was not going to be cool. So that's why I'm not doing it in Levon, because that's your only choice. So R, to the best of my knowledge and Jonathan's knowledge, cannot do this model using regular full information maximum likelihood. M plus can, and Stata can, although Stata handles missing data a little bit differently. So the only difference, there's very few differences in the code to do this. In M plus, there is an option called categorical, where you are denoting variables that are either binary or ordinal and it figures out how many submodels you need based on the distribution of the variable. So I'm specifying link equals logit. I'm using something called Monte Carlo integration um, because I'm trying to avoid numeric integration via quadrature. And I have for those two binary outcomes, rather than having intercepts or means, I have this thing right here with the dollar sign. That is a threshold. So that's the logit of the lower category when all the, pr the uh, predictors of it are zero. Then the new piece with the random intercept that you haven't seen yet, this is how we define a latent factor, rand int by these two things. And then I fixed its mean to zero and I estimated its variance. So this is a trick that allows a covariance between my binary outcomes. And then I put in one indirect effect just for show and tell, not that I cared about it in the original paper. Okay, cough, cough, homework question. This is all we get for fit. That's it. So the idea of fitting the best model, the H1 saturated model, does not apply. 
because we can't describe these data with the covariance matrix because at the end of it are two binary outcomes. So there's no CFI, no RMSEA, no none of it. All we have is relative fit where I can put, compare this model to other models and do likelihood ratio tests to see if it fits better, but I don't know if it fits absolutely. So in this case, I wouldn't know that it's just identified. I only know that because I had to go through and see what was missing. But I have comments here in terms of what happened, how the results changed relative to what was in the original paper without the random intercept. Um, a few things changed, but not a whole lot. And then here is what it looks like in Stata. The only difference is that for the outcomes that need link functions, you put comma and then what the link is. And so this is Stata's GSEM package for generalized structural equation modeling. Otherwise, it works similarly. Uh, random variables, or excuse me, random intercept latent variables require capital letters. I thought this was hilarious. Stata insists that everything is in lowercase always, all the time, except to make a latent variable, you put capital letters in the front of it, and that's how it knows it's latent, because capital letters are pretend, apparently. <laughs> Craziness. But anyway, it tells you what you asked for, and it does, the way it addresses missing data is by pairwise equations. So for each possible regression in here, it uses as many cases as it has, but not all of them. So that's why the sample size differs across these because not everybody has everything in, in the original study. And then here are the outputs, and it gives intercepts and z-thresholds. And that's it. Ta-da! Okay, are there any homework questions I haven't covered yet? I think that was the last one. Because it's 140, so better be, right? <laughs> All right, questions on any of that? Everyone's in a daze. Well, then let me stop the share so we can all see each other again. Yes, how question. Come, how come we include a stretch factor? Stretch factors? Yeah, for, well, for example, if we have a zero inflated or zero truncated dependent variable. In M+, plus, you, there is an option called count equals, and you can tell it what kind you want, Poisson, uh, negative binomial, and zero inflated versions uh -huh. of those. And it would be something analogous in Stata where instead of logit, it would be um, neg bin or something like that. Wow. So in the PowerPoint slides, there's a list of all the link functions that Stata has. It has more than M plus for this, right. but it doesn't handle missing data as well. So it's like six of one, half dozen of the other. But anyway, I wanted to stop the screen share so that you can all see each other and I can all see all of you and say thank you for sticking with me this semester and working hard. I know that we covered a lot of stuff probably covered it too fast, but what I'm hoping for is that you have resources to take with you into the future when you need to go and do these things. So thank you sincerely. I'm going to cry. I always do this <laughs> at the end of class. So I hope to see you all next fall. Yeah. Take care of yourselves. Had good summers. Let me know if you need anything, okay? Yeah. Okay. Signing off for now. Happy Thursday. Have good weekends. I may not see you next week, but if I do, office hours. How's that? Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>